Hey everyone, my name is Rishabh and I got a 36 on the ACT with minimal studying. My philosophy is to work smarter, not harder, and that's why today I'm going to give you 10 actionable tips to get a 36 on the ACT. Now, why should you even trust me to begin with? I'm a senior. I actually took the test very recently, unlike 99% of the people on YouTube who took the test way back in the 80s. Um, this is an updated 2023 guide. And number two, I'm going to give you actionable advice. I've seen a lot of stuff online from companies like Princeton Review that give you really generic stuff, but I'm going to give you high impact, actionable tips that will actually help out. So that being said, let's get into tip number one, which is extending a little bit on Princeton Review. Practice from the official source. Don't trust companies like Kaplan, Barron's, and Princeton Review. At the end of the day, most likely, a lot of these large companies are just trying to make a profit. And so at the end of the day, when you purchase their books, they're going to have questions that are harder than the actual test in order to kind of scare you, maybe even lower your confidence a little bit so that you have to take the test multiple times or you buy more prep books from them because you feel more worried that you're not going to get a high enough score. So my advice is always to study from the official source, the actual test itself. When I studied for the ACT, I really only used practice tests that the official ACT provided real questions questions full length. I took all the sections, not just random questions here and there like you might find in some of these books. In fact, I've even used some of these books and I use them for like maybe an hour or so and then put them aside because they're not helpful. That being said, let's get into tip number two, which is to really grasp the entire format of the ACT, right? There's a bunch of these different sections and so each section has its unique flavor to it. Like for example, on the math section over here, I have this big red arrow. And that's because the math section gets harder as you go through it. When you first start of the math section, the questions are gonna be pretty easy. And that's a mistake I made on my first practice test. And that's why, again, I recommend using full length actual ACT tests. On my first math practice test, I started out really good. I finished about half of the math section, 30 out of the 60 questions. And then I was like, wait, I'm really ahead of the curve. I'm gonna go back and check my questions because I have so much time left. And that was a mistake because the second half is harder than the first half. And so you, then you run out of time. And so I learned that by doing the practice test and grasping the entire format. There's also a really important tip about reading as you can see here in the bottom left corner. And so I'm gonna get into that in tip number three, which is to skip by passage type. So you may have heard this online. This is more of, I'd say, a tip that a lot of people know about, but you can jump around from question to question or passage to passage. And so I, I genuinely think that one of the reasons why I got a 36 on reading was because I went to the science related passages in the reading first. Um, I'm more of a science guy. I've done a lot of science reading, whether that that is like science literature or just AP bio coursework, stuff like that. And so there's four different sections on the reading, which is prose fiction, social studies, humanities and natural sciences. And so I started out in the prose fiction uh, section on, on my official ACT test and I spent like one or two minutes and maybe it was just because it was early morning or whatnot but I could, honestly could not really grasp it well and so I skipped straight to the natural sciences passage. I went through that really quickly and I, I did well on it and then I came back to the prose fiction passage and then my brain was kind of warmed up and I found it wasn't as bad as I first thought when I was looking at it. So I'd recommend taking a practice test again, figuring out which section is your best so you can count the number you get wrong from each section or really just the one you feel most comfortable with and the one that you're able to do like faster. Um, and so like, let's say you, you take a practice test in the morning and you're just really struggling to get through that dense kind of reading on the sciences, um, then instead maybe social studies or humanities the right one for you. So try to figure that out and optimize your test taking strategy based on what sections are best for you. So that being said, let's move on to tip number four, which is tips on the morning of the test. So I have two really quick tips here. The first is to read one passage in your mind. So if you are um, lucky enough to get dropped to the ACT test, you don't have to be stressed while driving. Um, while you're in your passenger seat, have uh, one of the ACT tests downloaded on your phone. And what I want you to do is read one passage in your mind and then read one out loud. 
um, one entire passage of the reading section if possible. And that's because this will just warm up your brain. Um, and I found that this worked really well for me is that when you initially dive into the test, you're already warmed up and you've already kind of gone through that. Um, and a bonus tip to especially stay alert and ready in the morning of the test, um, something that's worked well for me is cold showers. Uh, this is actually backed by like real empirical evidence and real studies um, such as Fala et al. in 2021, where they show that when you take a cold shower, your mind suddenly gets shocked and you become alert. I know it's a, you know, it's a little bit of a drawback. It's obviously hard to take a cold shower, but it's something that can kind of spark your mind on the morning of the test and help you do better. Um, tip number five is to, this is more of a hack rather than a tip, and it's to guess the letter E and K. So on the math section here, this is what the math scantron is gonna look like, the bubbles. It's gonna be A, B, C, D, E, and then the next question will be F, G, H, J, K, and then the question after that will be A, B, C, D, E again. So what a lot of people do is they'll guess the middle answer, which is C. And the ACT actually knows this. They know that people tend to guess one of these three, right? Like B, G, C, C, G H or DJ, like one of the these middle three. And so what they've actually done is they've messed up the weighting of, of the different guessing responses. And so statistically, people have analyzed this. There's been like real people who have just gone in on a bunch of tests and looked through it. And what they found is that guessing E and K um, is your best strategy. So if you don't know the answer, of course, if you have no other idea of what the possibility could be, or if you ran out of time or something, then bubble in E and K. Um, in a straight line, like down, like let's say you have five questions at the end, you didn't finish um, and you have like five seconds left, just bubble straight down EK. This is a last resort type of thing or a type of thing if you have no idea uh, about the question, you can kind of guess this, um, but this, this does work. I'll link it in the description as well. Like it's kind of backed by some analysis that people have done. This is just for the math where it has five. On some of the other sections where it has four, then guess D and J, like basically the last letter there. All right, now let's move on to tip number six, which is bubbling at the end. So I don't just mean guess on whatever questions you haven't done yet. Um, what I mean is don't bubble anything on your Scantron until you finish the test. This is something I'd recommend for test takers who are really aiming for that 36 uh, or 35 or like really, really up there where you're able to consistently do like all the questions or most of them. Um, because it saves you time when your brain is doing one task um, like for example, let's say you're in an Excel spreadsheet, right? And you need to fill up an entire column with ones and then the column adjacent to it with twos. If you go one and then press the right arrow and then two and then down left one and then two, right? That's the switch that your brain is kind of making between the keys. And similarly on the test, when you finish a question, you're lifting your pencil up, going to the Scantron and then bubbling in and then going back to the test. And so it is actually more efficient for your brain to bubble at the end. So mark the answers in your sheet in the workbook they give you by circling the bubble um, in, in your workbook and then transfer those answers to the Scantron at the end. And that also saves you, like let's say you decide to change an answer, erasing on the Scantron is way harder than just you know, quickly Xing and then circling something on your workbook. And so I've actually started doing this in my other tests as well, like in AP classes and things like that, bubbling at the very end when they when you have like five minutes left, then go and bubble in all of your answers. When learning math content for the ACT, it's really important to make consistent progress every day. That's why this video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. Brilliant is the best way to learn math interactively and intuitively. Brilliant has thousands of lessons from foundational and advanced advanced math to AI, data science, neural networks, and more, with new lessons added monthly. For the ACT, it's really helpful to learn math intuitively and not just memorize things. I've been using Brilliant for the last couple of weeks, and as you can kind of see on screen, it's really cool how there's basically these puzzles and interactive problems that you continuously solve. And I think that that's something that's really core that will help people on the ACT and learning that math content. To try Brilliant for a full 30 days for free, visit the link in the description down below, and the first 200 people to use my link will also get 20% off. Now, back to the video. All right, tip number seven is to attack the graphs on the science section. So something that a lot of my friends have um, kind of told me is that 
you know, when you do the sign section, it's really daunting sometimes because there's just all these numbers. Um, and I've received this feedback from past commenters on some of my past videos as well. That it's so dense, like there's so many numbers and it's really confusing and that's totally okay. So what I'd recommend you do is instead look at the graphs and tables closely. If you have no idea what the passage is saying, it's talking about an electrode and you have no idea what that is, you have no idea what it's talking about, that's fine. You don't need to understand the concept in the reading in order to get the question right. Sometimes you literally just have to look at a graph and look at what is the X value here and what is the Y value here. You just see, okay, X when X is 30, what is Y? And that will be the answer. It's not really asking you something specific about the passage on the science section. So don't be afraid and really attack the graphs and tables. Look at the numerical values on the graphs and tables because that will help you answer the questions. And I believe science is one of the sections you can actually practice and you will have a lot of score improvement. This is kind of anecdotal from what I've heard, but people have improved their science scores very rapidly as opposed to something like reading that's more like reading comprehension that takes a lot of time to build. All right, tip number eight is on English, which is to stop being redundant. So on English, sometimes there's going to be multiple answer choices that will seem right. And um, even though I found myself as pretty strong with English, being a native English speaker and everything, redundancy was still annoying for me. Like there would be some answers where it's like, why do both of these seem correct? And that's intentional. The ACT sometimes is testing on how concise the answer choices are. So try to choose the one that is more concise. If you have no idea, choose one that might be a little bit more concise than some of the others, because that's often the correct one. All right, we're nearing the end here. Tip number nine is to forget about the previous sections. So let's say you bomb a certain section on the ACT, it's fine. One, there's a chance that you most likely, you might have not actually bombed it. It's actually labeled two here. You might have actually gotten a decent score and you just feel really bad because you were focused on one or two questions that you thought, okay, I got these wrong, right? You may have actually gotten a decent score. So if you bomb a certain section, don't carry those negative feelings with you to the next section. Just try to forget about the past section and approach each one in its unique state. And the second reason behind this, which is labeled as number one on my slideshow here, is that some schools offer super scoring. What that means is that let's say you really bombed a section, like you got 20, that's not even bombing, like um, I believe that's about average, like something like 15, right? That's, that's on the lower end and you were expecting a 20, right? Then, you can super score that. If you improve that section on the next test, you can super score and some schools will actually select the highest from each of the sections depending on your past test sittings. Um, and I don't mean that, you know, 15 or 20 is necessarily a bad score. The score is simply dependent on like what school you're aiming for or what guidelines some colleges that you're trying to attend have set. And so it's different for everyone, but that's just in general, I'm making a statement here. Now tip number 10 is my final tip, is to take full length practice tests, okay? You can often get these for 100% free. You don't need to buy a $2,000 course or buy a $100 Princeton Review book online. Simply use the full length practice tests available. I have a link in the description for these full length practice tests and you can use these real questions that aren't skewed, like they won't have varying difficulties because a company is trying to make you feel less confident about your abilities so that you purchase their book. They're real questions from the actual ACT and so I'd highly recommend just really focus on taking these practice tests and then afterwards analyzing what you got wrong on each section and improving those because now you actually have a realistic idea of what the questions look like and what your scores will be as well because after you take the test you can grade it and say hey I got a 29 or I got a 31 now I need to know or now I know what I need to improve on instead of working through that huge 500 page book. So taking the full length practice test is your best bet, link in the description. Now that being said, um, please feel to comment any test taking tips you have in the comment section below. Um, and I'd highly appreciate if you like this video and consider subscribing. Now watch the next video, which is also about the ACT and has some great tips. Bye-bye.